Uh, so I'm from uh, Queen Mary University of London. Um, and the uh, main aim of this group is to apply and develop digital technologies for analyzing both um, music and audio. Uh, it's a fairly large group of more than 100 people, um, including uh, staff and research students. And probably the, the most famous sort of uh, output of this group is uh, Sonic Visualizer, uh, this uh, tool for um, visualizing and extracting information from audio, which has been used also quite a lot in computational musicology applications. And um, it is broadly interdisciplinary in the sense that we are based in a computer science and an electronic engineering school. However, the, the group attracts people from also music performance backgrounds, musicology backgrounds, mathematicians, physicists, engineers, and so on. Uh, myself, I'm based more in the music informatics and machine listening field, along with uh, Bob, who's also uh, present today. Um, I'm going to briefly define what I call automatic music transcription, which you might define yourselves uh, as a audio transcription or digital transcription that I've heard yesterday. Uh, and then I will mention some specific uh, studies about using these technologies for analyzing Turkish Makam music, uh, Cretan dance tunes, and a larger project uh, for the, using the British Library Sound Archive. So I, I would define uh, automatic music transcription as the uh, process of converting uh, an acoustic music signal into some form of musical notation, which can be either uh, machine readable or human readable, depending on your um, context and application. Um, it is a, a fairly difficult problem, especially in the case of what we computer scientists would call polyphonic music. Um, um, basically, I mean many notes concurrently, and not, not referring to polyphony per se, and especially in the cases where you have many instruments at the same time. And um, there are quite a lot of applications uh, in this problem. Firstly, in uh, music informatics per se, uh, for organizing and navigating through music collections, but also in terms of uh, music production, interactive music systems, including automatic accompaniment, as uh, Chrisula mentioned in the previous talk, and of course, uh, computational musicology and ethnomusicology. And it can be divided into several small problems, including the pitch detection or multi-pitch detection, uh, instrument identification, onset detection, uh, derivation of rhythmic metrical information, uh, and then uh, engraving and typesetting, putting everything together into an actual, maybe human-readable score. So that's that on the problem. But what about using these methods for uh, world music collections? So the problem that we are facing and that many methods in MIR have been facing is the fact that there's this so-called Western bias. So many of these methods are developed uh, using maybe uh, data that are predominantly Western in some way. Uh, maybe we also make some assumptions when developing our computational or mathematical models about maybe 12-tone uh, equal temperament, um, maybe the, specific, uh, the presence of specific timbres, for example, maybe orchestral Western instruments and so on. I like the term Eurogenetic. This is uh, used by some of my colleagues um, that uh, were based in um, Istanbul, in Bogazici University, um, as opposed to what we call Western uh, music. And uh, also in terms of how we evaluate these methods. So often in, in the MIR field, we, we usually evaluate this and maybe uh, with respect to a semitone scale or some small deviation from uh, ideal so-called tuning, which would not apply for uh, world uh, uh, music. And there are also some specific challenges that when analyzing world music collections that you don't really find in so-called eurogenetic music. Uh, for example, heterophony. So when you have many instruments interpreting the same melody, maybe in different ways, maybe in different octaves. Um, so we, we need to, to address this uh, issue. Microtonality is another thing. Uh, you've heard before the performance of the quartet of piano. This is fairly common in uh, world music. And also, of course, the, the presence of different timbres, different instruments, um, and the, the lack of data that we have, of annotated data, uh, to train our methods. Uh, so that's a big problem. Usually, uh, when you are talking about automatic music transcription in the um, MIR sort of community, what people would expect would be a figure something like this, a piano roll uh, notation of pitch over time, and pitch is usually in semitone scale. That's not good enough when talking about uh, world music. So um, a few case studies of applying uh, these uh, and developing new transcription technologies for specific music cultures. The, the first one was uh, with a colleague of mine, Andre Holzapfel, who's now at KTH in Sweden. 
and we were, uh, Andre at the time, he was based in Istanbul, and we were investigating the opportunity to apply these automatic transcription methods to uh, Turkish makam music. And the main motivation was that there is a huge population, uh, maybe approximately the size of the EU, that actually listens to uh, musics that are based on similar model concepts to Turkish makam music. That includes, obviously, uh, music from Iran, for example. And uh, there are quite a few interesting case studies that you can make afterwards about um, how to um, use automatic transcription of Turkish makam music to study improvisations and differences between performers. And by also having an automatic transcription as an intermediate step, you can also explore some interesting tools that are available uh, in, the, in the realm of symbolic music analysis or uh, symbolic MIR. Um, interesting to note is that the, in, in the context of Turkish music, there is um, what we call an enhanced uh, Western staff notation with um, a few more accidentals to indicate the presence of uh, marker tonalities. And um, so the challenge we were facing in basically, can we extend existing Western uh, automatic transcription systems to uh, transcribe uh, Turkish makam music? So in order to do that, we had to spend quite a lot of time annotating some data uh, using uh, resources from the Comp Music Project, which was a fairly large ERC project uh, led by uh, Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona, um, focusing on uh, MIR and world music. Uh, we had access to a series of recordings of uh, Turkish makam music, along with reference scores that were not aligned to the performance. And we spent a lot of time using a semi-supervised approach to align the uh, 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 notation that was in a specific uh, format called SIMTR, which is um, essentially a MIDI-like representation enhanced for Turkish makam music, and align that notation to the audio. Um, and also then align it to the tonic, uh, which is a key concept in uh, makam music theory. So we had this nice collection, and using that collection, we use that to evaluate and create a system that was able to transcribe uh, these recordings into this CMTR uh, uh, symbolic notation. The idea is that you have a system that takes as input an audio recording, and we used, we developed a model that is based on a series of a dictionary of pitch of note templates. And these note templates were extracted quite uh, laboriously from uh, several recordings of uh, Turkish makam music we had from different instruments. We had uh, ney, um, we had um, a tambour ney is a, uh, a reed uh, instrument, tambour is um, uh, a plucked string instrument, uh, we had percussion and we isolated note samples and we annotated them, we put them all together in a dictionary and we created the system that is so-called makam informed, so the user supplies an audio recording, the user also supplies the makam, so the main mode of the piece, and the output is uh, the series of notes uh, identified by a start point, an end point, uh, the pitch centered by the tonic uh, in 20 cent resolution, uh, note that. And we also had a, another process because um, many of the pieces we were transcribing were heterophonic, so we had to come up with a, a way to suppress the output, so to end up with a the one single melodic line that might be coming out from several instruments that might be interpreting this melody in different octaves. And um, in the end, we ended up with a system that's fairly accurate um, for uh, transcribing Turkish makam music and can be used as a basis for making at least some manual corrections uh, in order to come up with uh, proper uh, and usable scores. And we also uh, were able to study a bit how the uh, actual music performance practice can deviate from the theoretical uh, sort of... Um, uh, uh, tunings and uh, uh, implied by the notation. And we, we did face a lot of challenges, including, of, of course, heterophony, but also the presence of percussion. And some of these percussive instruments are also pitched, uh, as in um, the, some talks we listened to yesterday, and that's also a problem that adds up. Um, this figure here shows the output in 20 cent resolution uh, for a specific recording. I'm going to try to play it now. Hopefully it works. No. Okay, let's try again. Let's see if it works now. So I'm going to play now the um, automatic transcription of this recording, uh, which is essentially a MIDI file.
so at least for this particular case, the system was able to detect most of the notes correctly, but this was a, one fairly simple piece. And uh, even though it was a bit noisy, but there are more challenges in, uh, when we're talking about ensemble pieces with many instruments and percussion. Um, moving on, so this was the first attempt uh, to create a description system for a specific music culture that was a non-Western music culture. And then um, also tying it very nicely with uh, Chrysula's talk, we are both from Crete, by the way, and um, we decided to also do another study uh, on using these methods to transcribe music from the island of Crete. Uh, so we had access to another set of recordings uh, from a project that was originated from Greece uh, that was about, uh, about um, creating a corpus for, from Cretan dance tunes. And the corpus uh, had audio recordings but also some reference scores transcribed by ethnomusicologists. And um, so we wanted to take the system to a next step, not only to output some MIDI-like representation with just notes and start points, but also to, to try to create a proper uh, staff notation in the end. So we also needed to uh, uh, use um, automatic methods for extracting rhythmic metrical information as well. Um, and we uh, ended up also creating a nice, uh, to expand this corpus to also include, um, to again, to align the uh, audio recordings we had with the um, reference scores to create a sort of um, uh, uh, enhanced scores that also contain magical information but also the note timings. And we created a system that is essentially doing beat informed multi pitch detection. So it both detects the beat but also automatically detects multiple pitches in order to output uh, a proper uh, human readable score. So uh, we selected a specific uh, set of uh, uh, dance tunes uh, called uh, the Susta, which is a very uh, common uh, dancing creed. Uh, and uh, we created a, a small but very rich corpus of audio recordings, uh, music XML uh, stuff notation, and uh, uh, MIDI files that contain both temporal and magical information uh, to achieve our purpose, and also magical annotations at the same time. So the scores uh, uh, provided by the ethnomusicologists looked something like this. And um, again, we created a system that uh, uses as input an audio recording, performs both multi-pitch detection, but now also beat tracking uh, in order to uh, output a proper uh, staff notation. And also we incorporated some tuning estimation that was uh, crucial in order to come up with an accurate result. So the um, result looks something like this. So the, the top two stuffs are the automatic uh, transcription of uh, the recordings and the top bottom uh, stuffs uh, are the um, manual uh, transcription of the same recording from an ethnomusicologist. By simply a first glance, there are not a lot of commonalities. If you look very closely though, you will start recognizing some commonalities. Also the, the different sort of assumptions made by the, the machine listening system versus the assumptions made by the, the human as well. Again, I will try to uh, play some of these uh, recordings, hope that it works again. No, again, I have to unplug. So, so I'm gonna play now the recording, the original one. Now the synthesized transcription. And two together. So again, there are mistakes. Uh, the method is not perfect by itself, but we are getting there, and that's a good thing. That's a promising thing. And uh, future, in the future, uh, we also want to investigate uh, not only objectively the, the difference between the uh, uh, automatic and the manual transcription, but also perceptually. Uh, the difference between the two, uh, which is something that is yet missing from the MIR field. And uh, the final thing I wanted to mention uh, in, in this talk was uh, then an application of these methods uh, to a larger corpus um, that was uh, done uh, through this uh, Digital Music Club project. That was a, a fairly large project involving many institutions from the United Kingdom and also involving the British Library and its sound archive. Uh, the main focus of this project was to uh, try to enable 
uh, digital musicology research uh, in so-called big data or large music collections uh, to connect different corpuses, uh, different data sets. Uh, so we try to connect both the sound archive from the British Library, but also some other collections like the Charm database, which is uh, from the HRC Center for Historical Music Performances. And also to try to make some of these MIR tools more accessible to musicologists without having to code anything. And, and also finally to try to, uh, let's say, not avoid exactly, but maybe circumvent some copyright issues uh, by making the computations that we needed to do on site at the uh, host of the archive, but to uh, share with uh, interested uh, researchers and musicologists the derived features and visualizations of those features. And uh, specifically, the, the, this project also involved uh, so-called classical music, but also world and traditional music. And for the latter one, uh, we had access to over 29,000 recordings from the British Library World and Traditional Music collections. Uh, the recording dates uh, span a wide range, and from the the oldest ones, uh, starting from the 19th century, are essentially uh, box cylinder recordings uh, that are quite a big topic in this uh, symposium. Um, mostly uh, from um, uh, folk songs from uh, English, Welsh, and Scottish Gaelic languages. Uh, also some uh, historical recordings uh, made uh, by the um, former empire at the time. And um, another interesting thing is that uh, we had access to also very rich but really noisy metadata. Uh, I think yesterday there was a, this example about um, having um, Yugoslavia as a sort of um, a country which is no longer existing. And this is kind of a, a very sort of relevant problem we had to face. Uh, that, so that, the, I mean, when we're talking about geolocations, it's not simply a spatial issue, but it's more of a spatial temporal problem. And uh, there was a PhD student at Queen Mary that spent a lot of time annotating and curating these, uh, that metadata. Uh, we don't have that much expertise at uh, Queen Mary on um, uh, metadata. This is something that hopefully some of you could help us with. And um, these collections are predominantly um, um, from either Britain and the British Isles, but also from the so-called uh, uh, former empire or commonwealth. Uh, so uh, Uganda, India. Uh, for example, in addition to Britain and Ireland. And um, in terms of the MIR methods used, uh, we were focusing on various levels of what we would call uh, descriptors or features. So we have uh, low level so-called audio descriptors such as uh, audio or spectrograms uh, or onsets, leading to what we might define as mid-level uh, descriptors of nodes being present or chords or beats, and finally to higher level concepts um, that might include temperament, instrumentation, or chord patterns. Specifically for automatic transcription, we had two settings. Uh, one was a semitone uh, resolution uh, transcription, but we also had 20 cent resolution transcription that was especially useful for the world music collections we had. And these transcriptions were also used as a basis to compute other more maybe high level descriptors such as pitch histograms or tuning and similarity. And uh, in order to make all these outputs accessible to uh, the wider community, there is a website uh, from the Digital Music Club uh, where people can browse um, uh, through these collections that have been uh, used and analyzed. Uh, and the, the aim here is not so much to analyze individual recordings, uh, such as from the, the CREM presentation uh, this morning, but to analyze and compare groups of recordings, larger collections. So maybe a sort of a larger scale comparative musicology sort of applications, let's say. And we also used quite a lot of uh, support. We had also quite a lot of support from the Telemata project as well in order to set everything up. And uh, so final thing, current work, where are we right now? Um, so that was the first attempt before with the, the Cretan dance students on coming up with a system that can export staff notation. Uh, we are taking this uh, further now to also uh, support uh, polyphonic music. This is in collaboration with the University of Kyoto uh, to create a system that can output staff notation even in the case of complex polyphony. And this is where we are right now. And uh, the question is where to go next. So I believe that uh, these are automatic transcription technologies can be really useful uh, methods and tools of, to enable uh, for the research in digital ethnomusicology. However, there are existing challenges both with respect to data availability and not talking about only audio itself, but also to annotated data. And also the so-called Western bias that is sort of pre pre predominant in MIR research. 
And an interesting challenge also that I think ties up quite nicely to this symposium, um, I think, uh, was a question that has been posed by some librarians. Now that we are moving uh, closer towards uh, publishing, to creating actual uh, staff notation. So before, uh, with existing IP regulations, uh, we could easily sort of share with the wider public uh, derived features. As long as those features could not lead back to the original audio, that's fine. There's no problem with that. But when you are creating a system that can output proper staff notation, then from the perspective of the library, uh, this might be considered publishing. So it's not, I mean, uh, a score is no longer a derived feature. It's something more than that. And there, there are IP issues. So who owns the IP on that? Uh, is it the composer, if they exist? Is it the performer out of uh, whom the transcription was made? Is it the uh, person who wrote the software? Is it the training data? I think Bob has also dealt with uh, some similar issues in the past about um, sort of uh, copyright attribution in these cases. And this is, I think, this is still sort of an open problem that we have to deal with in the future as these transcription approaches uh, uh, become more and more usable. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. In these links, you can also uh, download some of these automatic transcription tools if you want to try them out. Thank you very much. Thank you.